Um, first of all, I want to say how jealous I was that you started off with a presentation from an MEP who was talking about doing positive things in Strasbourg. We just have MEPs who go and shout at the people oh. in Strasbourg. OK, so yeah, we're going through a bit of a difficult journey at the moment in the UK, probably not to be the UK for much longer. For those of you who don't know where Keele University is, Keele University is a small university on a hill outside the town of Newcastle under Lyme, which is basically part of the conurbation of Stoke-on-Trent. So it's a Midlands town. Yes, Newcastle and Stoke voted for Brexit. Why did they vote for Brexit? Because this is the part of the UK that's been left behind. Stoke used to be famous for pottery. Heard of Wedgwood? Heard of Royal Dalton? Okay, it's one of your companies, unfortunately, that brought up Wedgwood and kind of killed off one of our industries. We all love Waterford Crystal in Stoke-on-Trent. Okay, the less said about them, the better. Um, we used to have mining, we used to have steel, all gone. So that this is the England that has been forgotten about and voted for Brexit. So that's where I'm coming from. What I'm going to do this morning, I've been doing research on volunteering for since about 2008. A lot of what I've heard this morning I'm very familiar with, okay? And I'm going to be pushing you a little bit to think beyond some of these findings. When I stand up and teach my students about volunteering, um, I say I'm going to be critical. That doesn't mean I'm being critical of what you're doing. When I say the word critical, I'm using it from a sociological perspective, which is understanding, basically, the social forces, the social structures, the power relations that sit behind a lot about what you are finding. So I'm not criticising what, what, you've, what you've talked about this morning. I'm going to raise a few issues that you might want to think about. But I'm just going to start off by talking a little bit about my volunteering because, okay, I forgot, that's the presentation, this is what I'm aiming to do this morning. I'm going to say a little bit about the historical context of volunteering in the UK, a little bit about the empirical analysis. I've carried out quite a few things. I've brought along only a couple of copies of, of, vol of research that I've done, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be going those into a huge amount of detail because you can read about those. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about theoretical perspective. So I'm going to go from the empirical to, to the theoretical. Now, I'm not going to use these headings much for the, route, the rest of the presentation, but believe me, that's really what I'm following on. But of course, I forgot before I started my presentation, what I want to do is talk a bit about my own volunteering. Because when I started doing research and volunteering, one of the first questions anyone asks, and if I go and interview anyone who's a volunteer, the question is, oh, what do you do? I think this is quite unusual because as academics, we like to think we can live in an ivory tower and therefore we don't have to actually practice what we do research on. But actually, if you're going to do research on volunteering, that is not acceptable. And I'm very much involved in volunteering. So I've just come back from guide camp, OK? I am division commissioner for guiding in Newcastle under Lyme, which sounds very posh, but the reason I do it is because no one else wanted to do it. <laughs> I'm not actually a dedicated guide. I've only been in the, in the organisation for about six years, OK? I just haven't, it was seven years. I just haven't spent five of those seven years running guiding in Newcastle under Lyme. Um, and we've just taken, 65 of us went to Waddle Hall, uh, which looks lovely here. I wish it looked as lovely as that when we were there. The river was a rushing torrent, so we couldn't do canoeing, OK? It was a typical July in... It, this is basically... We're, um, uh, we're in Lancashire, OK? It's not far from, from Preston. This is Waddle Hall. It's a girl guiding um, camping centre. And there were 65 of us, 40... Um, no, sorry, 60 of us, 45 girls and 15 volunteers. And it was hard work... And yes, it, the weather, we kind of missed the showers, it wasn't a washout. We took the tents down in the sunshine, so we didn't take wet tents back with us. Um, and there's a couple of things I want to reflect on about my time. Okay, maybe I, I was tired when I turned up yesterday after 48 hours on, on guide camp. Two things I want to reflect. Why, why am I a member of, of Girl Guiding? And one of the reasons, I, I kind of really got into guiding when I moved back, when I moved to Kiel, which I did in 2010. And of course, one of the things that I'm, of course, one of the things that people go along to volunteer is to make friends. We tell everyone this: if you're lonely, if you want to meet people, go and volunteer. Have I made any friends through go guiding? <laughs> have I? Is there anyone in my in my division who I would go and have a drink with just to socialise? I'm pushing it. Does that mean I didn't have a good time in Wado? No. What I really appreciate about guiding is you don't get to choose who you volunteer with in the same way you get to choose your friends. To a certain extent, you get to choose your colleagues. We do, after all, have interview processes. Guiding, obviously, we do have to interview because, obviously, we're dealing with, young, with children, so we do, have to have, we, we do have to select quite carefully. But basically, 
Having some kind of maybe lack of social skills is not one of the things we rule people out from volunteering. I basically, it's a group of misfits. But put them together, it's wonderful to see this group of women come together and run a guide camp. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And what I learn about guiding and this kind of organisation is that we kind of forget about the weaknesses. Those weaknesses that are often amplified when we're outside of these volunteering structures, we can forget about them. We know some people don't pull their weight. We know some people aren't particularly that competent or we can't rely on them. But you get the, these 15 guiders together who can run an amazing experience for, for 45 girls. And that's what really matters. It's, it's coming together. The strength really is in the organisation and, and it's in the teamwork. Um, and I have a great time in their company for the 48 hours on Guy Camp. The fact that I probably wouldn't want to go for a drink with them afterwards doesn't matter. The friendship happens through the volunteering. And that's the theme of what I'm going to talk about now this afternoon, is that we shouldn't be focusing too much. If you want to think about the value of volunteering, which you were challenged to at the beginning, the value of volunteering is volunteering itself. And maybe we should stop worrying too much about these outcomes, employability, well-being, etc. And rather than measuring those, we need to be returning our attention to what we actually do in volunteering, because that's what I get out of guiding. is isn't meeting friends to go to the theatre, to the pub, etc. with, but it's actually spending time with people whose company I really enjoy in the context of running a guide camp. The second thing, the second observation, is because this was a division camp, so we took girls from throughout New Newcastle, Newcastle is a market town, it has its area of affluence and it has its areas of deprivation. And what we really, really benefit from is rather than if you just work in your individual units, which tend to be very localised, so they tend to be either very middle class or very working class, is that, is that actually a division camp brings all the social mixes together. Yes, it's dominated by the precocious middle class kids. I much prefer, and I love to see the kind of the working, the, the, the child from the less affluent background coming along and a little bit nervous to begin with, but really enjoying it and really having an opportunity. And of course, that's what I like because I'm committed to social justice. But I know I need to have the middle class kids there as well, because for one reason, they're the group who turn up. They give us the numbers that make it affordable so we can actually take the, least, the less advantaged girls with us. And we need a social mix. And one of the biggest problems we have in the UK at the moment, which is the one reason why Brexit has happened, is because we have more social polarisation and more inequality, and we're not actually letting people mix. So volunteering lets people mix. And I think this is another one of the really advantages that we need to be focusing on more on what we actually do in volunteering. OK, so I want to start off by giving a little bit about a context about student volunteering in England, although some of my examples are probably going to come outside of England. For those of you who aren't familiar um, with this book, they're published in, in 2014, Ge Georgina Brewis's fantastic book on the social history of student volun volun volunteering. This basically gives you everything that, that you need to know. It's a really very valuable. And one of the things I would recommend, if you are setting up a research agenda on volunteering in Ireland, do look backwards as well as look forward, because we learn an awful lot from, from history. And what we know about student volunteering is that it's always been historically important to the mission of higher education in England since the middle of the 19th century, okay? Though it's complicated and diverse history. And as Bruce, I think, very effectively demonstrates, because she has a very much a chronological um, approach to her historical analysis, is we can't separate volunteering from the historical development of the universities <coughs> and also general social and economic history. You get the volunteering that works at that particular moment. Looking back, we can critique it hugely. It comes across as very patronising, a lot of the activities that used to be done by student volunteers, particularly in the 19th and the early 20th century. Does that mean that these were activities that were wrong? No. It's those were the activities that fitted the social political conditions of the time. We've got to recognise a lot of the activities that we're doing now fit our social and, and political circumstances. It doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be critiquing them. It doesn't mean to say that they have some kind, that they are somehow right, that they are necessarily appropriate. We do them because that's what the over arching political rhetoric encourages to do. Looking back, it's, much, it's very easy with hindsight to criticise what we did in, in the past. And what we need history for is not to criticise the past with, with hindsight, but to use that knowledge to better understand the conditions in which we deliver volunteering in the present day. So the historical development very quickly. We started the 19th century with the settlement movement. This is a picture of Oxford House, which is in the east end of London. Basically, 
Oxford, Oxford University in particular, sent students out into, into the poor areas and the east end of London. It's one of the most affluent parts of the UK nowadays. It's no longer full of, of a kind of, 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 of working class housing to very much send students out in order to educate and, and basically do a processes of social improvement. So that's, that is the settlement movement which very much the development of student volunteering in the 19th century. The Edwardian um, period, this, this was replaced by student, student surface, um, um, student surface the, 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 so it, it shifted, it kind of, its geographical position shifted from going out into the communities to working more closely with communities closer to the university. And there's a very strong um, uh, 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 Christian um, um, part and um, backing to a lot of this movement, the settlement movement as well was very much um, um, grounded in, in in kind of non-conformist, so very much, no, rather than Catholic, this is very much to our kind of Protestant roots. And remember, particularly Oxford University is very, very closely involved with the Anglican Church. It's not a, it's not a Catholic university. Um, in post World War, in post World War One, when we're dealing with the ravages of what happened, we've just obviously another, another kind of commemoration that we had, as well as you know having our, our kind of mourning that we've gone in, in into now for the European Union. We've also recently um, commemorated the Battle of the Somme which makes us reflect on why we have the European Union in the first place. It's kind of a bit ironic in a way. But there was a big commitment to international volunteering about developing friendship and, and support. Okay, So this is not surprising, this is what happened after World War I. We also then started seeing the emergence of a more kind of carnivalesque approach to volunteering. So fundraising became an important part of activities, as also was the development of RAG. Do you have student RAG? Mm -hmm. OK, very much this happened in, in the, um, uh, the, uh, after World War I. 1920s and 30s, here very much a focus on self-help. OK, so we start to see this discourse of responsibility is creeping in, in the 20s and 30s. Um, and students were very much involved in the general strike. Students were strike breakers, okay? So a lot of the, the volunteering that students did in the 1930s was, for example, driving buses, etc., um, during the period of the general strike. So again, that might, we, might reflect on some of our issues about social justice and volunteering. In the 1930s, though, we start to see, as we're heading up towards World War II, a real turn towards political activism and social consciousness both at home and abroad. <coughs> um, we start, we see, this is, a, this is a picture from a student camp. So this is, like, this, this were camps that were run almost exclusively for working class <coughs> unemployed men, for, for education and self-improvement, about getting, they were, they were, it was, they were mostly run for, for men, getting working class men um, into the kind of outdoors, giving them skills, etc. Again, th these camps come across as very patronising and obviously given that similar things were happening in Nazi Germany as well, if you think of the Hitler Youth, some of these images, these pictures of these camps in the 1930s look very suspicious to us, but again, we've got to put it in its context. Students are very much involved in the anti-fascist move, movement as well. A lot of students signed up and fought in the Spanish Civil War. When, at the beginning of the Syria conflict, there were some interesting, interesting debates about whether there were similarities between people going to fight before ISIS got involved, but when people were first um, signing up to go and fight for the rebels in Syria, whether there were similarities between students and young people fighting against Assad in Syria to what happened uh, to students who fought, um, um, who fought for the Republican side during the Spanish Civil War. And of course, they were also treated as political prisoners when they returned as well. So some of the, kind of, some of the ways in which we treated our student volunteers and young, young volunteers who signed up for the anti-fascist movement similar kind of echoes about Syria. Obviously, ISIS and all of that has kind of blown some of those debates apart. After World War II, we start to see a bigger commitment to student community action. And this really kind of dominated student volunteering from the, during the 50s, 60s, during the 1970s. So we get a, a, a re-engagement in political activism, but less so on a, world, on a kind of an international scale, more about a local, a, a, a local scale. We also though, do see the importance of students returning from voluntary service overseas and wanting to adopt some of the, some of, some of the learning from, from doing uh, VSO into local communities. So this precipitated a more collaborative and political approach to volunteering. The importance about student community actions is run by students formed with the local community, addressing local issues. 
And interestingly, housing, which is one of the biggest problems as well we have within the UK at the moment, was actually one of the biggest motivations for a lot of the, the early um, student um, community action groups. Um, actually, young people recognising, students recognising that there were issues around rent controls, etc., and that students advocating for fair and just access to housing, not just for students, but also for local, local communities. Given all the debates we have about studentification, do you have similar debates? in Ireland about students taking over whole neighbourhoods, etc. It's interesting that, that, that this was actually an important uh, um, um, origin for volunteering. So, the present day, where we're at, we have very much in, in, in the UK, very much a mix and a kind of a, a diverse basis for student um, support. We still have the vestiges of student union or student community action, but it's kind of dwindled a little bit. And in some institutions, this, is, this has become professionalised. So even if you have, so in my university at Keele, our volunteering shop is located within the student union, but it's run by professional services. Okay, so there is, stu there is still student volunteering located within student unions, and there is still student community action, but some of that is kind of like, has definitely become more, more <coughs> professional. What's really happened is we've seen the career surface get involved, and particularly in new universities, so we have this distinction between the pre and the post-92, so our former polytechnics who don't be, have the same tradition of student community action, a lot of their, a lot of their volunteering is, is, is situated in career surface and around employability. I have to give also a shout out for Adam O'Boyle and his organisation Student Hubs. Oxford University didn't have as, uh, any, didn't have student, com, student um, 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 community action didn't have um, a real basis for student support so Adam and a group of students set up student hubs which is a social enterprise to support um, students community engagement so students have the power and potential to shape a better world I really would recommend that if you want to find out about some of the issues about how we might want to run volunteering differently I much prefer the student hubs model than I do to the careers and employability model as is going to become rather obvious as I move through um, this afternoon's presentation. We've tinkered a little bit with sur surface, surface learning, but unlike the US, we, it, it hasn't really taken off the ground. And it's kind of still very much muted. And in recent years, it's very much shifted towards a, more an internship approach. So a lot of, a lot of, a, a lot of, of, um, a, a lot of a kind of work, a, 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 a lot of these, approaches to learning now rather than focused around volunteering is more likely to be through a work placement so um, experiential learning in the UK is, is, it seems to be suited better to a work placement approach rather than a volunteering approach um, so we kind of kind of kind of very much got a mixed bag um, uh, a, a, a mixed support so you will find different levels different kinds of support in different universities so who's volunteering, how many and who's volunteering in the UK depends on how you ask the question. So if you want to set up a rigorous research programme on student volunteering or any facets of volunteering, the first question you have to work out is how are you going to ask the question and do you use the V word or not? Because if you use the word volunteering, you're going to get a different answer than if you don't use the word volunteering. So bits of research that I've done. So I, carried, I did an analysis of a... Um, of a, of a of a data set called Future Track that was not set up to measure student volunteering, but was basically just set up to measure students' progress through university. But they asked about volunteering. So I applied and I was given permission to analyse this data on behalf of Volunteering England to find out about the characteristics of volunteering. So when you ask the V word, we find about between 15 and 20% of students volu volunteer. When, we, when I carried out the research with the, with the Institute for Volunteering Research that was funded by of the National Coordination Centre for Public Engagement. We did our own um, survey, also using Survey Monkey that you are doing, and we didn't ask the V word. We asked about helping out, making a contribution. We found around about 60% of students um, volunteer. So ask, using the V word really does make a difference. Um, so how many? It's a little bit, it depends what question you are asking. Who's volunteering? We all know this. More women, uh, more middle class, more prestigious, um, higher um, universities, this really matters within a UK context. Ethnicity maybe goes slightly the other way and we find that it's more likely to be our non-white students but particularly our Asian students who are volunteering. All of these need, quali need qualifications. I think often the time we don't see male volunteers, 
the actual numbers we get in statistics are always far higher than if I ran a, a, a if, if I ran a sort of a workshop on student volunteers. It's mainly going to be women there. We don't see the guys because we don't always capture the kind of volunteering that they're doing, which often tends to be sports-based volunteering. As soon as you start to ask that question differently and ask, are you involved in a society or a sports activity, you find you get more guys volunteering. So the gender needs qualification, <coughs> class and higher education needs qualification. This in the UK is more important than class. So a working class kid at a prestigious institution is more likely to volunteer than a middle class kid at a less prestigious institution. So there's a close overlap here, and institution seems to matter more than your class background. The other thing is though, working class kids who go to their local universities do not, local, do not volunteer through their university, but volunteer within their home communities, and they also have quite high rates of volunteering. And that kind of tends to muddy some of our understandings of are they doing student volunteering, because they're obviously not, often not volunteering through student or university-run organisations. They're volunteering in their own organisations. As we have in Girl Guiding, lots of, lots of, I have lots of my members from Newcastle are actually go to Keele University but they've, and because they haven't left home and they've carried on volunteering with Girl Guides. Um, and so the, eth the ethnicity, we have a very strong... Uh, we have slightly higher among Asian and Chinese students um, and that also tends to be very much linked to... to um, the kinds of, of, of degrees they are doing. They, they seem to be uh, influenced uh, by both the employability agenda, but also particularly among the Chinese, a kind of a different ethos towards um, community and support. So there's something that needs unpacking there. We haven't really unpacked that. Okay. Um, so why volunteer? Now, um, you're all asking this in your research. And so my first suggestion to you is don't ask it. I don't think you can ask someone why they volunteer. I can tell you why people volunteer. I can tell you it's about confidence. I can tell you it's about employability. I can tell you it's about um, wanting to make a difference. If you ask someone why they volunteer, because our discourses about why you volunteer are so high, if you ask someone, well, why are you doing this? Oh, it's to make friends, it's to confidence, it's my CV bumper, blah, 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 blah. Does that mean anything? Um, I don't like asking it, so in my qualitative research, I don't ask it at all. I always use um, what I call, what I always use a technique called biographical narrative interpretive method interviewing, which basically means you don't ask any questions. <laughs> you start off with a, I want you to tell me basically a long question, which is, can you tell me your volunteering story? Start from whenever you want. They tell you a volunteering story, then you construct the interview around that biography which means you don't ask, oh, so why do you volunteer? If you ask that within a, within a qualitative interview, I can tell you exactly what you, the answers that you're going to get. That's why you're all getting the same findings. It's not that we're necessarily getting insight here. We keep on getting the same, same findings. So I don't think we should be asking about motive. I also think, and I, you, you will gather I have a think about employability, that it often dominates but I think it's misleading because that in the UK is the overarching emphasis that you, you, um, that you're meant to be signing up to volunteering for that CV bump up, right? That you're going to stand out. You're going to do something that is distinctive. Now, I've just finished writing a paper, hasn't been published yet, I haven't been submitted it yet, called Generic Distinctiveness. Because can I just point out, this is a contemporary oxymoron, we cannot all stand out from the crowd. <laughs> if we're all different, then who are we different from? And this is the point that's always worried me about this employability argument about volunteering. Ah, oh, you're going to do something different. Oh, yeah, but once everyone's got that volunteering tick box, how are they all going to be different? And that's the thing we really do need to think about when we start to push the employability. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. It's much more, I think, useful to focus on how people get into volunteering. And I'm, what, what I heard this morning is pretty, pretty similar to what we found out the importance of the serendipitous route. Um, it's, the, it's the importance of, have you thought about? It's that influential person, the number of young people I've spoken to who has been a teacher at school. Or it's just been at the right moment at the right time. The reason I was division commissioner was that I just happened to be at an event where the county commissioner for, for Girl Guiding was there. And I was talking to her and she suddenly thought, oh, I've got a job for you, okay? So we've got to remember about that serendipitous, that chance encounter. So the importance of other people. Um, I've heard an awful lot about the fact that when you go and talk to non-volunteers, okay, the reason that they're not volunteering is they don't know how to. They don't know how to how to volunteer. I don't believe that for a minute, okay? 
the most, the most honest answer I ever got from a non-volunteer was, just can't be bothered to get out of bed. <laughs> they know these sources of information. I'm going to say this again in a minute. Be wary about, yes, get your information skills out there, get your apps, make it easy, of course do all of that, but don't think this is necessarily going to bring about a step change in, in volunteering. Another one of my important messages is, if you push it too much, right, young people are going to resist. We tell them so much, you've got to do this, you've got to tick that box, you've got to do that. And, and the only way a young person can resist is through not doing it. Boredom is such an important part of being a young person. If any of you have read, I could encourage you to go and read Resistance Free Ritual, which is the classic book that was written by the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies back in the 1970s, and it's anyone who studies youth research should read Resistance Free Ritual. And, and, and Corrigan's brilliant chapter on, on, on kids just sort of like hanging out, right? Young people, if we see them hanging out on the street corner, oh, they're up to no good. No, actually what they're doing is they're just being young people. We live in a world where, remember, that the working classes from the, from the 19th century onwards, the only way you could resist is through strike, is through withdrawing your labour. We've made it so much harder for people to go on strike, to withdraw their labour. Young people, we tell them, you've got to sign up, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. The only way they can resist <coughs> that message is by not signing up. So you've got, to, you've got to tread a very careful path between making it all available, encouraging people, because... We know volunteering's great, okay? I'm not anti-volunteering. I think it's fantastic. But the more we tell people, the more we push it, the more you're going to find resistance. And the only way that young people can resist, the only way they've ever been able to resist, because youth, by its very nature, is lacking power. We can empower... I hate the word empowerment, by, by the way, because actually power is... If I empower someone, I'm still, I'm still more powerful because I'm... Foucault basically teaches the most powerful thing you can do with power is give it away. I'm still keeping it. I'm empowering it. I'm empowering you to become responsible. No, I'm still retaining that power. The more we tell people, the, the, the way we will, we, will, we will find that young people will resist and young people will, will not get involved. They will tell you, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where to go. And that's what they will tell you in official surveys because they have to give you the kind of the official answer. Okay. Um, so those who do sign up, yes, self-improvement is part of it. Okay. Um, and, and because young people do want to bring about change, and we should always recognise youth is a time of liminality, it's a time of change. So we should be encouraging young people to think about not the person who they want to be in five, ten years' time, this is a big part of my argument this afternoon, but the, the person they want to be at the moment. We also need, though, to remember the importance of choice, but to recognise that actually young people, we tell young people they have to make choices at the moment. But actually, our options to make choices have been very much foreclosed. There's a wonderful paper by uh, an Australian youth researcher called Dan Woodman. I can give you the reference. I, I quote it in almost everything that I write. Who makes the point that the point about individualisation is that we tell people they have more choices. But you can't make a choice anymore because we don't know the outcomes of these choices. So we know a degree is no longer a route into graduate employability. So we ask people to make choices about university to get a good job, but actually they don't know what the outcomes are. So we tell people they've got choice. But how can you make a choice if you don't know what the outcomes are? If you can't weigh up what your options are because you don't know what the outcomes are. So a little bit about roots into volunteering going to go. So this kind of uh, confirming what I kind of the quotes from, from volunteers, the first bit about, you know, this sort of like uh, this kind of serendipitous. So it, yes, the visible notes are really important. The second one is from Wetherby, and I kind of really like this. I've quite, I use Wetherby quite a lot. And this is talking about his experiences of volunteering at school. <coughs> Everyone had to sort of some kind of experience of volunteering. I think it was just like a tick, tick box sort of thing that, that they made students do. A lot of the people, you know, resented, you know, being forced to do voluntary work. But actually, yeah, you know, quite explicitly, it's like the reason for just to find volu volunteer work. So, you know, yeah, if you volunteer, you'll stand up more as a person to us and we'll be able to write more about you when it comes to university applications. There's a resistance to being told that you have to volunteer. And, of course, it's an oxymoron once we start being told that you have to volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, employability, another quote from Wetherby. It's like another thing for students that you know you have to do now, isn't it? Work, work, experience, volunteer, all these for the university. I've already pointed this out. Once everyone volunteers, what are the benefits? I'm not suggesting that there aren't employability aspects of volunteering. But this idea that you're going to stand out to future employers because you volunteer, can we not? Can we start to refocus that message, please? There are other messages that we could um, that we could be enhancing. So Adam O'Boyle, who set up Student Hubs, 
likes the idea of social literacy. Actually, if we're committed to social justice, if we have social justice in our volunteering programmes, we're going to be sending out more social literate um, graduates into the labour force. And is that more valuable than actually the personal benefits that you're more likely to get a job through signing up to a volunteering programme? So I'm not saying that there aren't employability aspects, but the idea that you, that you volunteer in order to stand out from the crowd, that's what I am disputing. We also have to think about the acquisition of skills, knowledge and confidence. I'm going to say a little bit more about confidence in a minute as well. What we don't know enough about what happens here. This comes back to my observation about my girl guiding experience. It's the volunteering that matters. We focus too much on this kind of these outcomes, but there's very little research that actually looks at what students actually learn and what they actually, and what they actually do actually mapping what they do in volunteering to what they're actually learning. We assume all of these things are going to happen and everyone talks about confidence, but I'm saying we don't know enough about how this actually happens and we need to focus more about what we're doing in our volunteering. Um, evidence of volu in volunteering employability is subjective and does not necessarily disentangle causality. If I've got a moment, I just want to do statistics. This is a statistics 101, okay? But I just wanted to point something out. If you're setting up a volunteering programme, this is a short statistics lesson that you need to understand. Okay, so we have a group of young people. We have two groups of young people. One group do a volunteering and the other group do not do a volunteering. Okay, and we measure the outcome, right? Okay, now this randomized control trial, right? Okay, it fits the medical model. We find that this group of students get an outcome and this group of students don't. Therefore, we assume that it's the volunteering that matters. You agree with that? <laughs> it's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> the problem is, you don't necessarily know you've got the same two groups of mm. young people. Wherever there is a causal link, I'm not denying that there isn't, there's also a backward link. And the, um, uh, so in, in, in statistics, econometricians know about this problem. We call it unobserved heterogeneity. And we have models, we have ways of dealing with it. If you've ever heard of someone talking about latent variables, multi-level multi models, um, structured equation modeling, we can sort this out. We can control for these differences to actually understand better what's happening here. But if you just do your simple randomized control trial and you don't properly control for the differences here, <coughs> you're not actually proving this. And there is a really bad bit of research, I hope there's no one here from Books, which is the um, um, organisation that supports um, sports in university. They did this. They demonstrated that those who do sports in university are more likely to have a higher paying job. Therefore, do sports at university. But they didn't control for any of the characteristics of the young people. And most of the young people, of course, the point being is that young people are more likely to get a high paid job um, on graduation from university are more likely to do sports. <coughs> they're more likely to come from middle class backgrounds, play rugby, etc. So is it the sports that makes a difference or is it the characteristics of the young people? Mm. So you've, got, mm. to, you've yeah. got to actually get your stats right, okay? But you need, you need large data sets to do this. And we, the trouble with volunteering is we haven't got the right data sets. So that's your stats 101 lesson, okay? Right. However, what I do think, if we're going back to it's volunteering that matters, the kind of things that we need to get embedded within volunteering, I... I'm committed to social justice. I kind of gave the game away a little bit when I talked about my guiding, that I like to work with the students from the less advantaged parts of Newcastle. But I have to recognise I have to work with everyone. Uh, 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 um, and we always, always have to be careful about how we design our volunteering uh, so students learn about social justice. We have to recognise that students are not actually ha have the power in them to, to make a difference, right? If we send students to work with the homeless, they're not going to be able to actually do much to change the lives of these homeless men. Particularly if we're looking about whether it's access to housing, you know, that's beyond the capacity of young people and students. It's beyond the capacity of an awful lot of us. So that's why our social justice, and that's what that, that, that paper the, the, with the epistemo what is the, epistemo uh, the epistemological challenge of volunteering? I know it's got a very fancy title, but we're arguing that we have to, we have to embed social justice into volunteering, but we also have to support <coughs> students for our curriculum <coughs> so they learn about social justice. In other words, even though I'm saying it's the volunteering that matters and I want to make you not worry too much about out outcomes, um, if there is an outcome that we should be promoting rather than employability, it's about how you learn about social justice. Um, so, um, and there's a, lots of young people volunteer with homeless people. It's a very, very popular thing to do. 
when we are sending students out to do these kinds of activities, we have to think about what can they actually do. And this, I did a, a fascinating interview with a, with a student who did volunteer with, with the homeless. And she was very reflective on, well, we've been a bit patronising here. What can we actually do? And, you know, what is the purpose? And, and, and she learned an awful lot about social justice because she reflected on it, because she was supported and she talked about it with the other students. In contrast, we have a lot of mentoring. Are you obsessed about mentoring? Yes. In the, oh, obsessed about mentoring, right, okay. If, if you're not a mentor or a mentee, you're not a subject in late modernity. And so all this mentoring, we're going to solve the world through mentoring. Um, what I find about mentoring is that people kind of kind of latch on to if I can just save one person, I'll feel better about myself. And again, we need to reflect about, are they learning anything about social justice? If I can just save this one person. So I think if we just focus on the mentoring route, I think we need to think about some of the, um, of, of the wider political debates there. Um, so this is our argument that, um, so I'm moving on, on, I'm moving on, to, I'm moving on to the last part of the presentation, I've only got about five minutes left, I know. <coughs> volunteering and social justice, that we argue that the ways in which young people engage in volunteering can take two different forms. Now this isn't a dichotomy, it's not either deconstructive or reproductive, you're going to get mixes, right? So a deconstructive volunteering is, is volunteering which supports young people to have the resources to recognise and challenge power relations and inequality in society. And this is our suggestion that if we're going to embed social justice to in volunteering, this is what we need to be aiming towards. As opposed to reproductive, where young people unknowingly reproduce dominant power structures through their involvement. Students will say they volunteered and they realise how lucky they are that they don't come from the same sort of family backgrounds, the same sort of social deprivation, but it's really inequality about luck no there's some very very strong social forces and power relations that it's not about a question of luck so it's a question about making students actually move beyond thinking how lucky they are to actually understanding the kind of power relations that actually um, create the conditions with which they are volunteering in okay so thinking about not having reproductive volunteering but having deconstructive. And what Josie Quinn and myself argued, and Josie Quinn's Professor of Education, is that to get deconstructive volunteering, you have to look about supporting students, and you have to think about embedding these ideas within the curriculum. So it is actually saying that surface learning might actually be the, be the route here as long as we actually embed it correctly. Um, so enabling social justice, embedding social justice principles in volunteering through the curriculum. And this is one of my favourite all-time quotes on, on student volunteering. I use it in practically an awful lot of presentations. And I wouldn't be therefore fair if I, if I didn't reproduce it this afternoon. So this is from Morello and Edwards. So there's a lot of great, so there's a lot of great literature from the US. They have these debates. And I've, be, I've done a number of workshops um, in Canada recently where they're having really interesting debates about community engagement. So if you want to find examples, go to Toronto. But I think probably it's, I think there's more exciting things happening in Canada. Maybe our American friends will disagree, but there's lots of interesting debate about service learning and community engagement in the US. You are ahead of us there, and also in Canada. So do look to North America. So this is a quote from two North American scholars, quite apart from the insensitivity, disrespect, or dignity that might be imposed on those in need by volunteers operating on faulty motives. Charity work that is not guided by social justice values will, re will reproduce unjust structures and fail in the long run to stem the tide of injustice. And I think that's something, if that's kind of an ethos that we can take into volunteering, I think, uh, I think that's kind of a really good basis to start from. So there is lots that we can draw on from the North American experience. I'm not going to have time to show this video, I'm sorry, but I think we've got the message. I want to talk about a couple of other things now, about things that we might get from volunteering. You all mentioned confidence this morning. Can I ask you a simple question? What is confidence? I spent quite a lot of time trying to find people who've written anything. I mean, Aristotle wrote about confidence, but he wrote about it in a more kind of a more kind of a kind of social good kind of way. It wasn't. I don't, didn't find Aristotle's writings about confidence particularly that useful. It's that we have this ongoing mantra about confidence. Um, the Glasgow University is just a whole load of kids just saying, "Yeah, what did you get from your?" your um, enrichment activities, yeah, confidence, confidence, <laughs> confidence, confidence. Um, it, is become, it is becoming the demarcation of the transition to adulthood. Young people do not have confidence, and adults have confidence. That is the difference. <laughs> um, <laughs> my argument is the epistemological basis of confidence remains obscure. I don't know what the difference between not having confidence and having confidence is, other than someone tells me. Um, so what has been achieved here? What are young people doing and what 
And what is the confidence? What is the outcome here that we're seeking to identify? So in terms of, because you've all mentioned this, and I've, 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 heard, I've, I've heard the confidence word banded around so much, and I kind of, my challenge, one of my challenges to you is, well, what are you actually, what is confidence? What, is, you know, what are you people actually getting out of all of this? And I can tell you, you won't find an answer in, in, in the literature, because I've, I've gone looking for it, and I can't find it. I think what my danger is that confidence kind of, it, it, it reinforces the, the kind of the lacking approach to young people. Young people lack confidence. So rather than celebrating youth as a time of liminality, of creativity, where you can do things, you can fail. The other thing is just that young people aren't allowed to fail any, any, anymore. I did a wonder, when, 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 when I did work experience as a 16 year old, they sent me to an accountant's office. Now, am I an accountant? <laughs> I spent three weeks in the accountant's office. I learned one very, very valuable thing. I didn't want to be an accountant. So when I was at Oxford University and everyone was going into management accountancy, I sat on my hands and said no. So I was actually very, very grateful of my three weeks, bored to tears, hating the accountants who equally hated me. That's a really valuable experience. It was a failure, but a very useful failure. So rather than thinking you lack confidence, you've got to get confidence, what about the options for trial, for mistrial, for failure? So rethink volunteering. I've got two more, <coughs> two more slides, then I'm done. My daughter is fed up with me telling her this. And I said, if someone told me this when I was 16, maybe I'd have done life a little bit differently. It's the journey, not the destination, that matters. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, but it is the journey, OK? It is the volunteering that we do. Yes, the outcomes are going to come about, but refocusing on what it actually we're doing in our volunteering. So it's what we do in experiences as, as volunteers. And if we start to focus on what we do as volunteers, rather than being obsessed about the outcomes, so that question, what's the value of volunteering? It's volunteering itself. I'll give you an example. At Keele University, our Vice Chancellor, we have a strategic plan. It's not a strategic plan because it's to become a top 30 university. We're currently 44. I have a plan. It involves Semtex. But I don't think the VC is <laughs> going to like my plan. The problem is, is that the VC has not bothered to come up with a delivery plan. So we said we're going to become a top 30 university, but we don't have a roadmap. I have no idea how we're going to become a top 30. So what's the point? <coughs> and, it's, and all universities, we all know how to have these mission statements, these ambitions. But that's, that's that. Yeah, you, they're printed on a fancy piece of paper and they're, you know, they're sort of in the VC's waiting room, etc. But they're pretty meaningless. What matters is the plan. What matters is the delivery. And what matters is the path that we are on. Um, so we need to what I wanted to say by this, recognising the mutual benefits which are contextualised and sometimes ephemeral. Um, we have, so I, do, I don't think we need to be scared about saying you enjoy volunteering. I had a great time on Guy Camp. Yes, I made a contribution and I can come back with that halo, that feeling good. I think we should celebrate that. Don't, we don't have to think that it's all about this, something that's necessarily <coughs> worthy. I think we have to recognise that it's actually what we're doing in volunteering. If you have a good time, that can be enough. So some of our benefits of volunteering are ephemeral. And a lot of them are going to be very much only achievable within the actual space of after volunteering. And let's kind of let's not be too worried about having to say it's always got to have this kind of grander purpose. Yes, those grander purposes debates are important, but let's do more to actually celebrate what we do in the spaces of 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 volunteering. Um, we have to recognise that not everyone's going to become more social, literate, employable, or confident through volunteering. And if they, and if these grander outcomes don't happen, then that's then, then that's maybe just we have to accept. We can we can do one of two things and think, well, okay, maybe the volunteering's not right, for example. But also just just be able to kind of celebrate the fact that people are actually taking part. So I what I'm arguing is we kind of need to refocus our attention back into what what we're actually actually doing. There's a, I have a theoretical explanation to this, so it's a uh, work I'm doing at the moment, it's not published yet, which is that we need to develop non-teleological practice. Okay, So I've even got a, a fancy term for it. So tele teleological practice, this is, this is Greek. Um, this, this is a, um, te teleology is a Greek word, and it basically means an, 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 an ethics where the end justifies the, the means. So a teleological is where the outcome matters. doesn't matter what you do, the end always justifies the means. So by non-teleological practice, we want to argue the opposite. So it's very significant in Western um, philosophy. If you want to know more about it, I'm working with my 
my, my colleague Sarah Hall, who can tell you an awful lot about, 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 about Plato and Kant and all of these, uh, how very much tele teleological thought has dominated a lot of Western philosophy. So what we are, what we are trying to do is kind of make the argument against, te against teleological practice to non-teleological. -tele if I had more time, I could have showed you this wonderful um, little film, which is um, is the blast, blast from the past, because it's David Cameron before he became prime minister, talking about parenting. Okay, this is a really good example of, te of teleological thought. I don't know what it's like in the Republic of Ireland. How much responsibility do you put on parents as being responsible for citizens of the future? Okay. It's a, we're obsessed about it in, in the UK. It's what parents do, okay? Between, between the ages of three and six, as long as you get the early years, years correct, everything's going to be, the outcomes are, are going to be there. We charge parents so much with the responsibility of doing parenting right, not so they enjoy parenting, not so they have fun with their kids, but to ensure that their kids grow up to have good education, to be good citizens, not to be overweight, involved in sports, volunteering, etc., etc., etc. Teleological practice dominates so much of our political and academic, academic discourse, and I think parenting is a really great example. Again, so when I tell, tell my daughter it's the journey, not the destination, I wish someone had also told me that when I became a mother and actually spent more time enjoying my time with my daughter rather than worrying what the outcomes and worrying what her grades, etc., etc., were. O okay? So teleological thought dominates so much of what we do. This is kind of what it looks like. This is from the Marmot Report, which is about health inequalities. You might think, what's that to do with volunteering? But this is very much what dominates a lot of academic thought within the UK, the life course. We move along it upwards, onwards. We accumulate, OK? So what happens here has a big impact on what happens at the end. So getting this right is really important. This is what we want to try and argue against. Where are our delusion lines of flight? Where are our failures? We live in a post. We, I'm I'm very much follow of Foucault, Foucault and postmodern thought. I can be whoever I want to be. Where's our opportunity for change, fresh starts, turnarounds, etc. So that's what we're trying to argue against. This dominant thinking that everything is about about accumulation that we build up. Yes, me, yes, we have memory, okay, and, our, and, we, and we imprint memory in our body. Bod, uh, memory is both embodied. It's not it's not just within the mind, but we can unlearn. We can unlearn. I do yoga. One of the things I learn about yoga is you can unlearn your body. And that might not sound grammatically correct, but it's really important. Because to say unlearn sounds like I don't know how to speak English. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have that. We almost like we don't understand what unlearning means. My last slide. So what would non-theological volunteering look like? Emphasis on doing, not the future outcomes. We think about our activities appropriate. We have to think about the balance of harm. How do we have to recognise that not getting involved is the right thing to do? How many schools need painting in Kenya? I think we probably painted most of them, okay? Um, and it also tends to be Kenya, because obviously we don't want to send them, but probably Kenya's getting too dangerous. It's probably just small parts of Kenya that we can send these kids to now. Are our act activities supported through the curriculum and wider learning? Can we bring about change? Just because we're focusing on activities doesn't mean that we're happy with the status quo. If we actually want to bring about change, we've got to focus on the roadmap, okay? So te non teleological isn't about ignoring these bigger social questions. We think about we bring change through our activities and focus on individual kind of engagement rather than motivation and results. So there's a slightly, we're recognising the dominance of individualisation here. Um, one of the things I'm quite interested in, are there parallels of kind of mindfulness? Are you obsessed about mindfulness yes. in Ireland? Right? Yeah. I don't like it's teleological, you know, heal yourself, listen to a tape about bird song for five minutes. So again, I think, I think mindfulness, I think this idea of stopping flow activities, you use this term menstrual flow activity that stops you thinking, that, that shuts off your mind. I do, I do dressage, right? Okay, it might sound an odd thing to do. It's fantastic. When I'm stuck on that horse for a half an hour, all I can focus on is getting the horse to do what I want it to do, and I don't think about anything else. And it's such a therapeutic thing. So I, I'm kind of with some of the arguments about mindfulness, but I'm worried about the teleological side to it. But I think there are parallels here. And so finally, we need to celebrate the fun and the seven, serendipitous quality of volunteering. And if I was really brave, I'd probably get you to do a guiding song or something, but I'm probably <laughs> going to pass on that, because that's exactly, that's the kind of thing, thing that we need to celebrate. Thank you. Well,